Hello, um, greetings from planet Earth. Today is the disappearance day of Haridas Thakur. And so I will make a few comments on that, on Haridas Thakur's disappearance day. First of all, the uh, an obvious point that we, we celebrate disappearance days uh, generally among uh, non-devotees or those who are not spiritual practitioners, you don't celebrate the day that someone died or someone left this world. Of course, we understand, as Bhakti Noah Thakur said, that if someone thinks that a great saintly person dies, then that's just not paying attention. That's not really understanding. So a pure soul's passing from this world is a glorious transcending, liberating experience, which we therefore celebrate. So Haridas Thakur is unique in some ways. Uh, first, as we know, he was born in a Muslim family and he's also the older generation. He's the generation of Advaita Acharya. It's a generation before Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> Uh, and if we look at India at that time, and specifically West Bengal, uh, that was not a time of religious freedom. Uh, the Muslims were not great champions of religious freedom. When they conquered another country, and they did a lot of that in the few centuries after the Prophet, um, they had enough common sense to realize that if you conquer a country where there is a really large number of people of another religion, you can't just kill them all because that's going to get very messy and they'll probably rebel and kill you. You can't just kill them all and you can't convince them all and you can't bribe them all. And so uh, early on, if you look at the Muslim conquest, they came up with strategies to deal with non-Muslim countries that they ruled. And uh, so that, of course, they very actively, very enthusiastically continued trying to convert those people to the one true religion. But in the case of Haridas Thakur, we're talking about someone who was born a Muslim. And if the Muslims had Muslim conquerors or rulers, in this case, the time of <coughs> Lord Chaitanya, it's the Mughal rulers, if they had various strategies to govern and convert and deal with native people who are not Muslims, uh, their attitude toward Muslims in these countries was much simpler. And that is, you're a Muslim and that's the end of the story. And if you have any other idea on the subject, uh, you'll, you could easily get yourself killed. Um, to give an example, there was a group of Muslims in India, and of course everywhere, other places around the Muslim world, called Sufis. Uh, basically the Sufis are something like the Bhakti Yogis of Islam. They were mystics, they were devotional, and many of them were actually intelligent. And they appreciated Bhakti Yoga, they appreciated Krishna consciousness, they appreciated various aspects of Hinduism. And they were, many of them, not all of them, but many of them were inclined to sort of what we would call nowadays take an ecumenical approach or interfaith dialogue, something like that. And of course, they adopted things from the Bhakti Yogis, whether a certain bhajan or kirtan styles or, and so on. So, uh, they were sort of the liberal, open-minded, interfaith, ecumenical branch, which made them very unpopular with many Muslim leaders. And so the, the Sufis themselves were often persecuted, and many of them were killed because of their, you know, being ecumenical, being an ecumenical or interfaith Muslim in a Muslim-ruled country 
uh, was not at all a safe thing to do. Now here we have the case of Haridas Thakur. Haridas Thakur is taking it to the next level. He's not merely engaging in what we might call interfaith dialogue or appreciating the presence of God in some other religion. He actually becomes a Vaishnava. And as, as you know, Vaishnavas worship deities. And in Islam, the greatest offense that a person can possibly commit is called, and I believe in Arabic, it's called shirk, S-H-I-R-K, which means to, in some way, try to uh, visibly, tangibly depict God in this world. Like, I mean, for example, these people are so fanatical that in many parts of the Muslim world, you could not even paint pictures of anything. And that's why Muslims became some of the greatest calligraphers in, in the world at that time. Calligraphy, of course, is writing, but with very fancy, beautiful, artistic letters. And they became masters of calligraphy because if you were an artist in that Muslim world, there was really not much else to do. So not only couldn't you depict in paintings or drawings God, which would, I mean, that was absolutely unthinkable, but even just trees or birds or flowers, it was a very, some way, strange approach to life, fanatical approach to life. And Haridas Thakur leaves Islam, which to this day is an offense punishable by death in probably... I don't want to say most Muslim countries, but a lot of Muslim countries, if if you leave Islam and let's say become a Hare Krishna, I, I, there are many Muslim countries where over 90% of the people think that you should be killed for doing that. And that's today, that's the 21st century. So Hare Das Thakur became a Vaishnava, which means he worshiped deities and oh my God. So he, the Muslim government tried to kill him. As we know, these are very famous stories. They tried to kill him. That was the normal response to someone that did that. So they tried to kill him, but of course they failed because he was a great uh, pure devotee and mystic and they couldn't kill him. That's a famous story. Uh, so if on the Muslim side, there was no question of interfaith or from the mainstream rulers, uh, on the Hindu side also, there were problems. I mean, the Hindus didn't, they normally didn't kill people that left Hinduism, but um, it was not the most liberal open society and all, I mean, the Vaishnavas tended to be that way, but as far as the smarter Brahmins and the caste Brahmins, they were, um, no one would call them liberal and open-minded. And, and so the idea that a Muslim is becoming a Hindu priest, so to speak, that was a real problem too. That was a real problem. In fact, Prabhupada said that um, he was talking about how the Muslims would convert, especially lower class Hindus, uh, which explains something about the condition of Pakistan. But anyway, can, can, uh, they would convert lower class Hindus. And uh, Prabhupada, I remember he gave one lecture, he spoke very strongly. He said that it was the fault of the Brahmanas that they could not bring those people back. They could not bring them back to Krishna consciousness. So. It's not that uh, Hindus in general or Brahmins who really controlled Hinduism. They had this, this was not, Hinduism at that time was not democratic. It wasn't like some kind of Protestant thing where the congregation elects a minister. It wasn't like that. You had hereditary Brahmins who ruled Hinduism with an iron hand. And uh, they were not wildly enthusiastic about a Muslim becoming a Hindu leader. So even on that side, it was not very much appreciated. So if you look at, first of all, Lord Chaitanya accepting Haridas, not only accepting him in his movement, but making him the Namacharya, 
elevating him to an exalted will. I mean, Haridas is exalted. Lord Chaitanya recognized his exalted status, recognized that this is a very great soul. And so Lord Chaitanya recognizing that and acknowledging Haridas as the Namacharya, and Haridas risking his life and, and uh, surviving many attempts by the Muslim government to kill him, for the sake of Lord Chaitanya, makes this a very special and interesting story. Uh, and of course, from the point of view of Lord Chaitanya and, um, and Haridas Thakur, Haridas was not converting from one sectarian religion to another sectarian religion. He was accepting a universal truth about Krishna. Which, which transcends any sectarian religion. But good luck explaining that to caste Brahmins or Hindu rule, uh, Muslim rulers. You were not gonna convince them. So this is a very special story. Haridas is a very special soul, a very, a very great soul. He's described sometimes as Lord Brahma or as Prahlad Maharaj. Uh, Prahlad because of his extraordinary tolerance and uh, his ability to, his stamina to survive all these murderous attempts, which of course is exactly what Prahlad did. Hiranyakashipu, sort of the uh, number one rated Asura, very powerful Asura, tried to kill his son in many ways and failed. And so when the Muslims failed to kill Haridas, naturally people thought this must be a reincarnation of Prahlad Maharaj. So you have Haridas, and um, today's his disappearance day. So these days are extraordinary opportunities because it's natural on this day to think of the person whose day it is. And today is Haridas's day. And so just by thinking about him, remembering him, meditating upon him, and, and trying within our own limited uh, situation to follow him, to emulate him, trying to be like him as far as possible within our, as they say, reduced circumstances. So um, that's the opportunity to spend this day meditating in Haridas Thakur, honoring him, appreciating him, and trying to find inspiration to advance in our own Krishna consciousness. So that's the short message for today. I hope it was short and sweet. And uh, hope we'll see you all again soon. Hare Krishna, Hare Das, Thakur, Ki Jai.